whether you're here in person today or whether you're joining online with us today, man, it's a pleasure to have you. And we're so glad that you're here. Many of you, you had to overcome a lot of obstacles to be here today. And I just want to thank you for being here. And I pray that the Lord just speaks to your heart and blesses you today. Uh, well, I said I'd keep teaching on this topic as long as you kept coming and you're here today. <laughs> so uh, let's, just, uh, let's just say it this way. Whoever has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit has to say to the church this morning. Amen? Amen. You're here, you're faithful, and, and I pray you have an ear this morning. Um, that means just to walk, turn off your knower and what you think you know and tune out the mind of the flesh just for a moment. And turn up your faith and tune into the mind of Christ. And I promise you're going to grow through today and through this series. Uh, if, if you only hear through the filter of what you've been spoon-fed horizontally, it's going to be very difficult to hear the vertical truth that's found in the Word of God. And so that's where we really need to settle our hearts this morning and, and make sure that we have fertile ground, that we can hear the Word of God through all the noise and chaos of the world. Um, we're talking about being politically incorrect in the name of Jesus. That's not a typo. Uh, that's what we're talking about, is being politically incorrect in the name of Jesus. And if you weren't here last week or you weren't able to listen to last week's message, I would encourage you to do so, uh, because that's where I spent 10 minutes giving a PSA, a disclaimer, if you will, about this series and what this series is all about and how not to be so easily offended at what is said, because uh, we just ain't got time for that today, amen? We don't got time for a 10-minute disclaimer, so if you find yourself offended, go back, listen to last week, and see why you're not supposed to be offended. Amen. And, then, and, and why you can find an opportunity to seek the truth that's found only in God. Again, my opinion doesn't matter, but neither does yours. Let's let God be true and every man a liar. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, at the end of last week's message, I mentioned in passing that this, this is nothing new that we face today. That we've seen it before throughout biblical and world history. The spirit of deception, if you will. It's been around for a long time. This deceiving spirit. And what we call it today, politically correct. Um, let me tell you what uh, about your Lord and Savior. Can, can I get a witness that Jesus was anything but politically correct? Amen. Amen. If, you did, if you didn't know that about Jesus, then you, you don't know my Jesus very well. He was anything but politically correct. He called people snakes and vipers. Did y'all know that Jesus did that? Did you know that your Jesus did that? Your sweet Jesus did that? He called people snakes and vipers. Why? Because he was raw and he was real and he spoke the truth. I mean, he was the stuff. He is the stuff. He is truth. Amen. So he spoke the truth unashamedly. And anything that he spoke, anything he did, he said, I didn't say a thing unless my father told me to say it. I didn't do a thing unless my father told me to do it. So when he called them snakes and viper, do you think his daddy told him to do it? Amen. Woo, man. Make you think, won't it? Amen. And, and he didn't just go, hey, your sin's okay. You know, it's all right. Your sin's okay. Let's just, let's just celebrate your sin so we don't offend anyone. No, Jesus said, repent. The kingdom of God is at hand. He said, sorry, not sorry. That's not in there, but he kind of said, sorry, not sorry, right? He said, confess your sin, repent, and sin no more. I remember when uh, people were ready to stone a woman because they caught her in the act of adultery. I don't know what these peeping toms were up to. I mean, think about it. They, never mind. I'm going, to flesh, I'm going to flesh that thought. So they caught this woman in the act of adultery. And I don't know why they weren't stoning the man, but they just wanted to stone the woman. Amen. And I remember Jesus writing in the sand. And we don't know exactly what he wrote. There's been a lot of speculation about it. But I remember that Jesus said, Ye who have the first stone, I mean, ye who have no sin, cast the first stone. And then he looked up and he looked at the woman and he said, where are your accusers? Jesus was the only one allowed to stay. He was the only one without sin. He says, neither do I accuse you. But he didn't say, now go and be free in your sin from now on. <laughs> he didn't say, I don't want to offend you, sweetie. Just don't get caught next time. <laughs> don't let these other guys watch you. He didn't say that. You know what he said? Repent. And go and sin no more. Church, Jesus was anything but PC. John the Baptist, he was anything but PC.
PC, you know, before Jesus started calling Pharisees and Sadducees snakes, you know, John the Baptist cornered that market. That was his thing. And Jesus just stole it. John the Baptist called them snakes. And he said, you don't even deserve to escape God's anger. That's what John the Baptist said. John, he brought the pulpit to the politics of that day. You know, I, I imagine there's a few last week that thought, Trey, don't preach politics. Church, I'm telling you, I'm not preaching politics. And if you're here in politics, we need to get our minds right. Not preaching politics. We're bringing the pulpit and the word of God to our political situation. Amen? Because it matters as Christians what we do and say in the world. And that we have a part to play in the culture of this planet. And what Jesus said is, Lord, we're going to pray this way. Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come on earth as it were. We have that part to play. Jesus wouldn't have prayed it if it was just happening in the earth automatically. So he said, this is how you pray, and we have a part to play in our society. Amen? Amen. Well, John the Baptist was anything but politically correct. And he brought the politics, excuse me, he brought the pulpit to the politics of that day, and he spoke to President Herod in the Oval Office of that day. And he said, it's wrong for you to have your brother's wife. President Herod, it's wrong for you to have your brother's wife. You can call that a marriage if you want, President Herod, but that's not a marriage in the eyes of God. That's not moral or lawful in the eyes of God. And guess what? John, the cousin of Jesus, was beheaded for it. He, he paid dearly for standing up for the truth and faith in Jesus. And, and he said, and he determined in himself, this is a line that I'm not willing to cross. This is a value that I'm not willing to give up. So he took a stand for the Lord Almighty and his word. That God's truth be true and no other. Peter. Can I get a witness that Peter was anything but politically correct? I mean, Peter was just rarely correct. Amen. I mean, Peter and I, we have a lot in common. We both like to fish. We both, we both would think as we speak. We don't think before we speak. We think as we speak, usually with our foot in our mouth. You don't have to agree with that so quickly. <laughs> Amen. Uh, and the Lord says that he chastens those that he loves. And, and man, the Lord chastens me and Peter alike. I'm chastened all the time by the Lord. So he loves us equally, I would say. <clears throat> but Peter wasn't PC. He said to the religious leaders, the religious leaders, listen, who, who were corrupt and were, were in bed with corrupt culture, religious leaders who profess to be wise in God, but yet they were yoked up with humanity and depravity. He said, this Jesus, whom you crucified, God has declared him both Lord and Christ. Amen. Hallelujah. We talked about that. He didn't care, church, who he offended or what, if what he said uh, hurt someone's political worldview. He preached Jesus Christ and him crucified. Knowing all the while that he probably wouldn't get that many likes or that many shares. He'd probably inherit a lot of trolls, right? Amen. But he did it all in the process of being politically incorrect in the name of Jesus. And that's our aim in this series. Not to, not, not to get trolls. But it's our aim in this series to, to distance ourselves. Distance ourselves from our horizontal culture that we're in and connect with the culture of heaven more and more. Amen. 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 So let me show you a few examples of this. Uh, not so new, if you will, spirit of deception called political correctness in the Bible. Uh, I don't know about you, but I was never taught this stuff growing up in church. Anybody was taught this stuff growing up? Okay, not, I wasn't taught this stuff, and I don't know why. I don't know if it was just because, you know, it was just hot topics. You know, we didn't want to you know, stir the, the, the toxic waters in the political landscape. I've always heard, don't mix politics with religion. You heard that? Anybody heard that? Okay, yeah, yeah. I see some shaking heads, yep. Um, I, I heard as a kid all the time, separation. They usually said it like that. Separation. And they just shook, separation. <laughs> Y'all ever heard? Separation of church and state. They don't even know what that meant. But that never really brought clarity to me as a kid. I was like, well, how does the word of God apply to our life today in this part? They wanted to separate church and the politics of the of the world at that time and and I grew up under a system that 
I felt, maybe this wasn't their intention, I don't believe it was, but I felt like you're saying, hey, this is your religious and spiritual life, and here's your natural worldly life. The two are separated. Got to keep them separated, right? I thought that's what it was. But as I've grown in the Lord, I've come to realize that, you know, the same guy you see on Sunday who's bawling like a baby up here today is the same guy you get at a men's retreat bawling like a baby at a men's retreat. I'm the same guy on Sunday that I am throughout the week. There's no separation. I was talking to somebody. It's like, would you want me to be a preacher all the time? No, that's my job. I want you to be who Christ has called you to be all the time. It's not a separation. That, yeah, but when I'm a friends over here and I'm, I'm hanging out by a crowd over here, I just want to be able to tell those jokes. I think they're really funny. Well, grow up. Sorry. Sorry. I just want to be able to do these things because they're lots of fun. And they're, but but, but I'll, I won't do that stuff at church. You better not. I don't like Jesus will get the whip after you. Amen. Spoil the child, those that spare the rod. I'll get the rod after you because I'm your spiritual father. Are y'all okay? Okay. I'm just, we just got back from men's retreat. I'm feeling a little courageous right now. Amen. I'm going to preach with the staff next week. I'm going to look at Josh and say, Josh, you better not come after you, boy. Anyway, i got to get back on my notes. I'm totally off. But I don't know why well, I was never taught this stuff in church. There's no separation. We are who we are in Christ Jesus. That's who we should be all the time. And we need to be that in our politics. Amen? And in our society, in our conversations. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they should inherit the earth. And, unless they're, they're speaking on political situations. And Jesus never said that, right? Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall inherit the, the earth unless someone disagrees with you in the world today. Well, get in line. A lot of people disagree with me. Amen. Let me, let me get back to my notes. But the religious leaders and the religious system of that day, they were so embedded with corrupt government that they wouldn't take a stand against the corrupt government of that time. And, and instead, what they did is they embraced the ideology They embraced the cultural narrative. They liked the power that they had as religious leaders over the masses, over the people. And so they forbid. Got to do something. They forbid and they censored the apostles because the apostles weren't saying uh, what they were saying the way they wanted them to say it and how they wanted them to say it. Let Let me put it this way. The apostles weren't doing what they were doing, saying what they were saying, thinking like they were thinking, behaving like they were behaving, so they didn't like it. So they tried to censor the apostles. And I want to, I want to turn there. We're going to be in Acts chapter 4 if you have your Bibles or you're taking notes this morning. And I want us to see what happens when the spirit of deception came against the apostles, okay? Acts chapter 4 verse 18. It says, so they called, they being the PC crowd and the religious leaders of that day, they called the apostles back in. And commanded, woo, man, I don't like that word. You know, I, I feel like when I'm commanded, I just want to go against it, right? Just me? Okay. Yeah, my wife's like, mm-hmm, you know me. <laughs> Love you, baby. So they called the apostles back in and commanded them to never again speak or teach the name of Jesus. Who do they think they are? Church, I'm telling you, who do they think they are? And let me tell you, this is nothing new that we're facing today. But Peter, and I love that. But Peter and John replied, do you think God wants us to obey you rather than him? We cannot stop telling about everything, about everything everything we have seen and heard. Let me just tell you something. I'm not going to just preach a little bitty watered down message to make people feel good and, and, and about themselves. And, and that's the only little message that we preach, church. I'm, I'm going to shout from the highest of highs everything that I've heard from the Lord Jesus. Amen. Every, amen. Everything that I've seen and heard we're going to preach and that's what John and Peter were saying here and so these apostles church they would not be intimidated by political correctness they would not be intimidated by fear tactics and intimidation they would not be intimidated 
by the spirit of deception. You, you, you can't say that name. That's offensive. You can't say that name. That's offensive to us. That's offensive to other religions. You better not say that name. Church, don't be deceived. God is not mocked. This is happening in the world today. For what a man sows, that also he will reap. We need to understand this. How many times do we just fret that why are our schools nationwide failing at alarming rates? Well, we took, we took the word of God out. We took prayer out. We, we're taking even now the name of Jesus out. Keynote speaker, speakers and valedictorians I know on college campuses, but even in high schools, church, they're having their speeches edited and they are forbidden to mention the name of Jesus. They're forbidden to mention. It's offensive. I don't care if you believe it's God who got you here. I don't care if you believe it's God who has highly favored you and blessed you. It's offensive to the masses, so you better not say that name. When Tim Tebow, and I don't care if you thought, like him or don't like him or thought he was a great football player, he wouldn't. Um, <laughs> um, he used to wear eye black under his eyes, and it had John 3.16. Y'all remember that? And uh, they didn't like it in high school, but he got away with it for the most part. But when he got in the NFL, uh, he wore eye black, John 3.16, and they started fining him. Uh, every game that he wore that, finding him, because he, they said, let me make sure I have it right, personal statements. They find him a fee for personal statements. Yet now, personal statements are acceptable on the back of your helmet because the NFL agrees and conforms to the narrative of our cultural society. And, and listen, the only political statements that are allowed on the back of the names are victims of police violence or systemic racism. Those are the only names that are allowed. Yet, listen, I want to tell you, the Jew and the Gentile, that's all everybody, and the politician not wanting to disturb the political landscape of that day, they all had a part in the wrongful death of Jesus on the cross of Calvary. That was an innocent man. And they, they replaced him for a murderer. And that, church, that is the name that's not allowed. Are you all Okay. Church, I'm, I'm trying to show you the great deception that's taking place in the world today. I'm telling you as a nation, we should not be ashamed of the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. We should celebrate the name of Jesus. We should, we should take to the streets to declare the name of Jesus. We should say His name. Amen. A lot of people have taken to the streets to say this name or that name because of a spirit of deception, because of spirit of emotions that, that swell up in people. And if you heard what I talked about last week, you know that I believe that all lives matter in the name of Jesus. I believe there are only five colors of dirt and only five main colors of people from the dirt we came, from the dirt we are, and from the dirt we shall return. And the only thing that matters is whether you have faith in Jesus, not the blood that runs through your veins or the color of your skin. Amen? Amen. And once you find faith in Jesus, we're not part of this race anymore. We're part of the grace race in Christ Jesus. Amen. Thank you for shouting me down. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. So we need to say his name. And a lot of people are embracing because of emotions swelling up in people and race baiting politicians and corporations caving to the whims of political correctness and not wanting to offend the mob. Let's not, church, bend a knee to the God of our emotions, but bow before the name that's above all names. Amen. Amen. Praise God for that. Amen. Why do you preach, Pastor? Why do you shout? I don't know. He's worth it. Now we should praise His holy name, not just in the sanctuary. The valedictorian should be able to say, Jesus is why I'm here. And I overcome the world because of his name's sake, and you can too. Valedictorians should be able to do that. And we wonder why our schools are in the trouble that they're in. They're forbidding the name of Jesus today. And we're, we're forbidding the name of Jesus today in our corporations, in our public school systems, throughout all of our nation. And as I spoke about last, reason, last week, there's a reason why we're a blessed nation. It's because at one time we said we are a people under God. And blessed is the nation whose Lord is the God Almighty. Amen.
So I want you to see something. They said, we're being forbidden today. And they were forbidden then from preaching the name of Jesus. And they get in trouble again in Acts chapter 5. Because in Acts chapter 4 is when they got in trouble the first time. They said, who do you want us to believe or listen to? You or God? Love that statement. Right? And then in chapter 5, just one chapter over, they get in trouble again. And I want to see this in chapter 5, verse 18. They arrested the apostles and put them in public jail. There's a, a horrible comedian. His name is Tater Salad. Anybody know who that is? Uh, a horrible comedian. But a really funny thing that he talked about, about being thrown. He was, he was, he was, he was in, it doesn't matter. I can't go there. But talking about public, anyway, this wasn't no private penitentiary, right? This wasn't no little dainty thing. This was a public jail that they put them in. Why? Because they're speaking in the name of Jesus. And don't be deceived. That could begin to happen even in this great nation if they clarify what I say from a pulpit hate speech. And I'm going to have to choose to listen to them or say, who do you want me to listen to, you or God Almighty? But an angel of the Lord came at night, opened the the gates of the jail, and brought them out. He broke them out of jail. And then he told them, now listen, listen to what the angel of the Lord tells them to do. He says, go to the temple and give the people a message of political correctness. Go to the temple and give them a message (laughs) of just tone it down a bit. Right? Uh, make sure you just don't offend anybody with the truth. Don't, don't run the risk of being thrown into public jail again. Don't, don't run that risk again by speaking the name of Jesus that offends so many. No, 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 no. That's not what the angel of the Lord said. Watch what he says. says. Give them, the people, this message of what? Life. Of life. Give them the message of life. Church, the message of life is Jesus Christ and Him crucified. The message of life is God saying, seek ye the kingdom of God and his kind of righteousness and all these things shall be added to you. That's the message of life. That's what the angel told them to do. Man, I love this. The angel bailed them. They can be broke them out of jail. That's my kind of angel. Amen. And listen, they weren't ashamed to speak the name of Jesus. I want you to see what happens. So the angel of the Lord, he bails them out of jail, and he tells them, in not so many words, to rain down fire from heaven with the message of life in the name of Jesus. And in verse 28, they caught, listen, they caught them doing, again, what they ought to be doing and told them not to do. Check it out. We gave you strict orders. <laughs> it's not going to go over well. We gave you, who's we? We is the political correct crowd. We is society who likes our position of power over the masses. We don't like the offensive message of Jesus. We gave you strict orders never to teach again this man's name. He said, instead, you have filled all Jerusalem with your teaching about him. Oh, church, that we would fill all of the schools in our nation with the teachings about Jesus. Oh, if we would fill our great land with the teachings about Jesus. Oh, if we would fill our next generation with the teachings of Jesus. Man, I thank I think God that we have an opportunity to live in a nation that's as free as it is today. But we don't need to neglect this next generation, church. May his favor be on you and your family. But their children and their children and their children. Oh, that those generations be filled with the name and the teaching of Jesus. He said all Jerusalem was filled with the name and the teaching of Jesus. And you want to make us responsible for his death. I love that. Well, aren't you? Aren't you responsible for his death? You want to make us responsible for for his death. Who do you think you are trying to hold us, public officials, some even elected officials, hold us accountable for our actions? Who do you think you are? I'll tell you who we are. We are we the people. Church, we have a say. As Christians, we have a role to play in what the culture of our nation looks like. And in verse 29, but Peter and the apostles replied, we must obey God rather than any human authority. It's in my notes, but I think the Spirit just spoke to me here. Church, this is big. I had to figure this out one time. 
in my life. And sometimes I even have to crucify it and figure it out again over and over. We must listen to God and no human authority. So that means this way, horizontal, right? I, I need to, I know, I know what everyone's saying. I hear, I hear all the noise. But we, we need to obey God instead of just human authority. Human authority includes you. It's not just here, it's here. Okay? I must obey God rather than my own emotions at times. Rather than how I feel about something, I have to obey the word of God, even if I don't quite understand or grasp, because he is greater. His ways are higher. I must understand the Lord God and his direction here, because even if I don't get it, my heart, my conscience is not a perfect God, but he is. Amen. Amen. I hope you get that this morning. What if we had such conviction as Peter and the apostles to know this might feel a little uncomfortable? Because we got to live with these people, right? I mean, they're putting signs in their, in their yards that don't agree with us. we gotta, we got to coexist with these people horizontally. So it might get a little uncomfortable to not do as they do or say as they say or think as they think or behave how they behave. But to know that even though we're in the world, we're not of the world. And yeah, we're responsible. Not, not responsible. That's a... Yeah, we're in relationship, if you will, horizontally with these people, but we're responsible vertically to the Lord our God. He, he's our people, and we're responsible to Him. And He is Lord of God, of, of, of heaven and earth, and we need to be responsible to Him. Are you okay? Okay, let me, let me go through here. This is in Ephesians chapter 4. It's a verse that we've become very familiar with lately because we looked at it in our last series about being totally developed. But I want to throw a new slant on it today. It's Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14. It says, Then we will no longer be immature like children. There's no, no offense to any children that are in here. We won't be tossed and blown about by, by every new election cycle, by every new presidential debate, by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever, they sound like the truth. Did you hear that? See, it wasn't by accident we talked about this in our last series, that we need to grow up and not be children, amen? We need to grow up. The issue that we have to face as individuals and as a church body and even as a collective nation, the, 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 the issue we have to face as a nation is that these lies, church, they sound, they're so clever, they sound like the truth, Okay? <laughs> That's called political correctness. Everybody say, I love, I love my precious little pastor. Again, my opinion doesn't matter, but neither does yours. Amen? And what does God say about the matter? You may agree politically with the purpose behind what I'm about to say, um, but I'm not, I'm, not even talking about, I'm not even talking about the issue even there right now. I just want to show, I want to use this moment to reveal the deception of something that's so clever it sounds like the truth. Are you okay? Lies so clever on the face of it. It seems good, it seems moral, it seems like truth, but it's tossing people around, even Christians, like immature little babes. Okay? Planned parenthood. Planned parenthood. It sounds great, doesn't it? I, I tell you what, if, if I ran the world, <laughs> that's a scary thought. But if I ran the world, you'd have to pass a test and get a license to be a parent. Y'all think that way too? Okay. There would be extreme parental planning involved. Extreme. I remember when Christy and I, we had Breland. Uh, she was our first daughter in the hospital. Uh, this is the day after labor and delivery. We're just sitting there holding our precious baby girl. And the hospital comes in with some papers. So these are your discharge papers. You're now ready to go home. And I looked at my beautiful, my beautiful bride who's now the mother of my, my daughter. And I look back at this precious little infant, this precious little angel in the bed. And I, I remember it was like it was yesterday. I looked at Chrissy and go, they trust us with her? <laughs> Didn't I say that? They trust us to take her home and she still live? We didn't, we didn't have a clue what we were doing. Parents, you ever felt that way? I still feel that way sometimes. Amen. Man, I just... You trust us with, we had no clue what we were doing. And so I'd make everyone pass a test, hallelujah. 
And, and, and it wouldn't be no DMV test. Have you seen some of the people on this road? They give these people a license. Jeremy? Amen. Amen. So, 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 so thank God I'm not, I, don't, I haven't been given the authority over people like that or we'd have no new people. But can I get a witness that some people just don't have any business making babies? Amen. So on the face of it, planned parenthood, on the face of it, sounds great. Sounds moral. Sounds holy. Sounds like the truth. But because of political correctness and the political correctness movement, it has hijacked the words and tricked, deceived the masses with lies so clever, it sounds like the truth. Planned Parenthood has nothing about planning for parenthood. It's about eliminating parenthood. And, and please, if you're offended today, check yourself in the Word of God. And if you want to talk to me about it, I'd love to have a conversation with you about it. Amen? Are we good? Okay, this text, church, was written over 2,000 years ago, yet it's, more, it's just as relevant today as it was then, what's going on in the world today, in our society. So 2 Corinthians chapter 2, and lies so clever, they sound like the truth. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 13. This is talking about a different kind of people, but it's still the, the, the meaning reigns true, what I want to share with you this morning. These uh, people, they're false apostles. They are deceitful workers who disguise themselves as apostles of Christ. But I'm not surprised. Uh, but I am not surprised. Even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it's no wonder that his servants are also disguised themselves as servants of righteousness. In the end, they will get the punishment for the, their wicked deeds. In the end... You know, you know what it says. You can read. Did y'all know that the devil disguises himself? Amen. He, you know, he doesn't reveal himself to people, and he just shows up, and he's like, poof, and he's in this red onesie, and uh, horns, and a, and a tail, and a pitchfork. I mean, even, even stupid Christians would go, that's the devil! I'm sorry, y'all didn't like that. Even uninformed Ignorant, immature, faithful Christians. Is that PC enough? Amen. Amen. So how do we get so deceived like, like, most, like most people in the world or even a lot of God's people are so deceived? It's because the enemy church is in disguise. The enemy is in disguise. And hey, you've heard wolf in sheep's clothing. You've heard things like that. The father of lies, this is what he says. He says, what I'm doing is love. What I, I care so much for people. I don't want to hurt sensibilities, hurt their nature. It's, it's care. I care. It's compassion. His true nature, church, is always cloaked with a veil of so-called righteousness. Amen. Isaiah 5.20 says, what sorrow for those who say that evil is good and good is evil. And dark is light and light is dark. And bitter is sweet and sweet is bitter. What sorrow for those who are wise in their own eyes and think themselves so clever. Church, this was revelation to me when, when the Lord revealed it to me. And I pray it's truth that sets you free as well. If you're taking notes... If you want to write this down, I think it's great. Political correctness and the spirit of deception. Political correctness is the original sin in the garden. I want to show you this. Okay? In Genesis chapter 2, God says uh, you can eat of all these trees. Okay? There's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of, of trees. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of yeses. Yes, you can eat of that tree. Yes, you can do what you want to with that tree. Yes, that tree has fruit that's pleasing to the eye and good to eat. You can eat of that tree. Yes, 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 yes. Aren't you glad there are hundreds upon hundreds of yeses in the kingdom of God? So he told them there's hundreds and hundreds of yeses, yet one no. See, we grew up thinking that the kingdom of God is all just no, 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 no. Right? But no, there's hundreds upon hundreds of yeses in the kingdom of God and here, but one no. He says, don't eat of that tree. 
the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Because in the day in which you eat of that tree, you will surely die. In the day in which you eat of that tree, you will surely die. Y'all remember that? Now I used to struggle with this greatly. Because why is it bad, God, that they eat of that tree? Now I would understand if, they, if God said, Adam and Eve, don't go and eat of the tree of obesity. I don't want that tree. Right? It'd be the bacon tree. <laughs> We ate so much bacon yesterday morning at the men's retreat. Bacon upon bacon. God, it's so good. Maybe I would eat of that tree. Um, but what if they said, what if God said, don't eat of the tree of, of curses and, 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 and darkness and death. All right, we'd stay away from that tree. But no, God said, don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Why, God? Why not of that tree? Don't you want... Us to know good and evil. And then the Spirit revealed something to me. Church, think about this. When they ate of that fruit, they didn't discover enlightenment. Mankind wasn't just inherently knowing rightly, both discerning good and evil. Church, man independent of God can't rightly discern both good and evil. Our conscience, our heart is not a perfect guide. From the fall of man, we have this sinful nature now. The Bible says in Jeremiah, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. And Adam and Eve, they went from allowing God to guide them in every way of their life, and allowing God to reveal his ways, to reveal what is good, what is holy, what is acceptable before him, to listening to something other than God to be their guide. Man independent of God can't, doesn't know. He or she can't discern what is good or evil. The choice that man makes independent of God always is a choice that leads to death and decay. Always and forever. Adam and Eve, they hid from God in the garden. And when God came to them and asked them why, they said, we hid because we were naked and we were afraid. Yet before they ate of the tree in Genesis chapter 2, the Bible says that they were both naked, the man and his wife, and they were not ashamed. So apparently, at that time, it was okay for them to be in the presence of the Lord and be naked and unashamed. Now, I'm not saying take your clothes off. Amen? Amen. Keep your clothes on. Hallelujah. <laughs> but what I'm saying is they, they knew what holy and acceptable was under the Lord their God. The moment that they went to decide something else was holy and acceptable is the moment that enlightenment left. I hope you're getting this. So one minute, they're listening to God, they're following His direction to receive their true identity, who they are, where they came from, their purpose for living, why they're here on the planet, what's right and what's wrong, their definitions of right and wrong. They came from God, they came from Him and Him alone. And then after biting into the lie, oh, we do that so often. After biting into the lie, apparently they're going to something other than God for their guidance. And God looked at Adam and He said to Eve, who told you? Who told you you were naked? I didn't. I didn't. So church, do we get our cues from culture or do we get our cues from kingdom? We should. Do we get our cues from culture or do we get our cues from kingdom? Who's Lord? Not Lord of one day in heaven to come. Who's Lord of your life lately? Satan didn't just wake up one day with church in heaven and go, you know what? I'm tired of all this goodness and all this wholesomeness. and I just want to raise some hell. I just want, I'm going to be the devil. I'm going to be so evil. I'm going to kill and steal and destroy. I'm going to, I'm going to bring such pain and suffering and sickness and death to everything that I touch. <laughs> and then God go, you out of here, buddy. That's not what happened. You know that's not what happened, right? That's not how, that's not how he got kicked out. That's not what happened. Here's what happened. Here's how he got kicked out. The devil said, I am going to exalt myself above the most high God. I will be like God, but without God. Sounds like the culture today. I, I know what moral is. Don't tell me what moral is. Don't quote some antiquated, outdated uh, Bible and tell me what moral is and what right is. I will be God of my life. That sound familiar? Amen. Look at what Satan said to Eve in Genesis chapter 3 in the garden. The serpent was like the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord God had made. One day he asked the woman, 
Did God really say, that's just like the enemy. Did God really say flee fornication? Did God really say adultery was wrong, that you can't sleep with another man's wife? Did God really say marriage was one, one man and one woman? Did God really say, do y'all, I could go on and on, right? That's how the enemy talks to us. Did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any tree in the garden? You see, see what he's doing? See what he's doing? Watch how she replies. Of course, we may eat the fruit of the trees in the garden, plural. The hundreds and hundreds of yeses, the woman replied. It's only but the one. See, it's the one. It's only, only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we're not allowed to eat. God said, you must not eat of it or even touch it. If you do, you will die. So that's the word of the Lord. God said this. Check out the enemy. You won't die. Someone's lying. Amen? God or the great deceiver, the father of lies. God, our deliverer, or, or, or Satan, the deceiver. Amen. The serpent replied to the woman, you won't die. That's just how the enemy operates. It's a spirit of, of deception. It's what I would call a spirit of being politically correct and the politically correct agenda. God says you will die. You won't die. God says, no, it's okay. You can do this. God says, no, no, it's okay. God says, this is sin. No, it's not. It's love. Verse 5, God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat of it. And you'll be like God. There it is. You'll be like God, knowing both good and evil. See, the deception wasn't the knowing good and evil. They already knew good and evil by the direction of the Lord their God. The deception was you will be like God. You'll be the master of your own universe. You get to say what's right and wrong. You get to say what's good and not good. That's what's happening in the world today. Man says, I'm right. I'm enlightened. I don't care what God says. Our ways are higher. Our ways are better. Your text is outdated. It doesn't speak to the culture of today. This is the 21st century, they say. I got Texas on you. Your text is outdated. You're, you're a, I've heard this personally, yelled at me. You're a bigot. You're crazy if you have faith in anything other than what we say you should have faith in. You're self-righteous. I've heard people scream at me. You're self-righteous. I beg to differ. I am not self-righteous. There's no good thing in me. That's to say my flesh. There's but one, and that's Christ in me, the hope, glory. I am righteous. It's not self-righteous. I am righteous in Christ Jesus and Him alone. Amen. Amen. You can praise God for that. Amen. So it's not self-righteousness. I'm righteous in Christ Jesus. Church, for the sake of time, let me end with this. Are you okay? Okay, I'm going to continue. I got... I got Five minutes. Okay. Thank you, Noe. I'll preach to you. I'm going to preach to Noe. <laughs> so I, I told you last week about Daniel, right? And how he was determined in himself, this a line I'm not willing to cross, this is a value I'm not willing to get, give up or let go of. Today I want to talk about his three friends, his three buddies, and they went through a very similar situation, okay? These were Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. These were some of the captured Israelites that were captured with Daniel that the Babylonians, they took into captivity and they wanted them, these Hebrew boys, to conform to the culture and their way of life. They wanted them to think like they thought. They wanted to eat what they ate. They wanted them to, to do as they did, say as they did. So their behavior would be just like the behavior of the Chaldeans or the Babylonians. Let's look at the story in Daniel chapter 1 verse 6. Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah were four of the young men chosen from the tribe of Judah. The chief of staff uh, renamed them with these Babylonian names. Daniel was called Balthazar. Uh, notice that we know Daniel by Daniel, his Hebrew name. But the other one, we, we, we simply call them by their, their Babylonian names. Hananiah was called Shadrach. Mishael was called Meshach. And Azariah was called Abednego. So... We got these three guys. Y'all know the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. At least most of you do, right? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now, the king wanted them to think like the Babylonians thought, to, be, to believe like them, behave like them. He wanted them to eat from the king's kitchen, as we talked about last week, but these items had already been sacrificed to their pagan gods. Daniel didn't allow that to happen, and he got he and his buddies out of, the, out of that mess. So he and these three didn't have to eat from the king's kitchen. Um, but, but I want you to know something. Their names, they were still changed. They went from these Hebrew names 
that represented their God, Yahweh, the God of heaven and earth, to now these, these Babylonian names. And they were changed to the point that even most Christians don't even know the names of Hananiah, Mishael, or Azariah. Right? They only know them by the Babylonian names that were given to them. And here's what I found cool about this story. And if you're taking notes, it's really neat. If you want to write down, you can just do H if you want to, and, and M and A if, if that helps you out. But Hananiah, who was called Shadrach, his name Hananiah meant this. If you want to take notes. God is gracious. Hananiah's name meant God is gracious. He knew who he was and what his name meant. Okay? Mishael means who is what God is. I'm going to say it again. Mishael means who is what God is. Man, I love that. There is no other. Who is what God is? He's God. God of the universe. God of the cosmos. There is no other. Who is what God is? And then, and then Azariah means, and I loved Azariah's, whom God helps. So these three boys, they knew who they were and who God had created them to be. They were God is gracious, who is what God is, and whom God helps. By the way, Daniel meant God is my judge. Woo, I love that. Who do you think you are, King Nebuchadnezzar? You are not the judge of me. God is my judge. I'm Daniel. Ooh, I love that. Okay, so the three pagan names given to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they just paid homage to three separate pagan gods that the Babylonians worship. Well, King Nebuchadnezzar, he had this gigantic golden statue that was erected uh, before Babylon. And all the Babylonians, all the Chaldeans, all of the conquered and vanquished nations, they were told by decree of the king that any time the music was played, they were all to bow to this great idol that had, had been erected. They were to worship the idol any time they heard this music played. Well, these three, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, they would not bow to this idea. They would not bow to the cultural norm. They would not bow to what everyone else was doing around them. Uh, they could have justified it. Can I get a witness? They could have justified it. Just like, like many Christians do in the world today. They could have said, if I bow a knee today, I'm going to die. I'm going to be thrown into a furnace. So if I bow a knee today, I'm going to die. So if, if I don't, excuse me, let me correct that. If I don't bow a knee, yeah, if I don't bow a knee, I could die. So if I bow today, guess what? I live to fight another day. And doesn't God want me to live to stand up for him later? Maybe God wants you to stand up for him today. So they could have justified that. They could have justified, well, this is just an outward expression. It's not how I really, truly feel in my heart of hearts. I'll just appease the masses. I'll just appease the government so I can keep my job. So I can keep my friends, so-called friends. So I can keep my way of life and not, not let it get too uncomfortable for me. So I can keep life itself. Hallelujah. They, can I get a witness? They could have justified it. They said, this is a line. This is a value. We're not living... We're not going to give up on them. Watch how they decided not to defile themselves in this way and how they stood for the Lord their God. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Abednego replied, Oh, Nebuchadnezzar. I, when I read the Bible, I just read so much sarcasm in it and I love it. So would you just read it with me with the same heart this morning? It's hilarious. Oh, Nebuchadnezzar. We do not need to defend ourselves before you. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace... The God whom we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. But even if he doesn't, we want to make it clear, crystal clear, perfectly clear to you that your majesty, that we will never serve your gods or worship the gold statue you have set up. Isn't that good? Amen. Praise God for that. If you're taking notes, there's three statements I think every Christian needs to see and every Christian, Christian needs to know. Okay? If you're taking notes, I want you to write these down. They're found in these verses. I think it, believe, it starts in verse 17. Number one, if you're taking notes, I want you to write this. God is able. Can I get a witness? God is able. They said, God is able to save us. God is able, church. Whatever you're going through, I don't know what you're going through, but God does. And whether it's just a, a financial burden, a financial woe, maybe it's a marriage woe, maybe it's, maybe, no, I'm not going to go there. Maybe it's whatever you're going through, God is able. Amen? Number two, if you're taking notes, God will. God will. Number two, God will. They said God will rescue us from your power. 
God is able. God will. But the third one, people don't want to, people don't want to write this down in their notes. They're like, I don't like the first two. I don't like the third one. Y'all ready for the third one? But even if he doesn't. I want you to write that down. This is important. But even if he doesn't. <laughs> so the first one is God is able. God will. Man, those are power, aren't they? To a Christian, man, we love to sing that. We'll sing that all day long. God is able. God will save us. God will rescue us. But number three, but even if he doesn't, even if he doesn't, even King Nebuchadnezzar, if we're thrown into the fire and die, even if we're like John the Baptist beheaded for standing up for the word of God, even if we're thrown into public jail, we will not serve the God of the day or the God of the hour or the God of the moment or the movement. We're going to serve the God, the only God who is God of more than enough. We're going to serve God of heaven and earth. We're going to serve the God who does not change, the God of yesterday, today, and forever. That's who we're going to say. Amen. Fantastic. Thank you, sir. They may have been given these new names, church. And that's what I want you to see. They may have been given these, these new names, but they never forgot who they really were in God Almighty. They knew their rightful names. They knew their true identity. So when they're standing there, these three buddies, and they're looking at King, and they're looking at the furnace, and they're looking at this, this abomination before the Lord, they look around the room and they go, I know your name. I know who you are. You are God is gracious. Man, I know you. You're what is. Who is what God is? They knew. I see who's with me. Whom God helps. Church, that's powerful. That, that blessed me when I saw that. And you know what is so discouraging about this passage? I mean, it's just heartbreaking, discouraging about this event. Is when they stood up to culture. When they stood up to political correctness. When they took a stand for God Almighty. The problem didn't go away. The problem did not go away. The fiery trial, their fiery trial, was not over. If anything, it got worse. The heat got turned up seven times hotter. So sometimes you're just trying to live your life, the best life you can before, before God. And then what happens? Opposition arises. The masses, your coworkers, your so-called friends, they don't like the name of Jesus. It's offensive. Don't push your faith on us. God's word makes them mad because it says what they're doing is wrong. It says what they're doing is evil. It says what they're doing is causing confusion. And so what happens? The temperature rises. Whew. Gets a little uncomfortable in here. It gets a little, little hotter. It gets a little, whole lot more uncomfortable. And then they'll give you another chance to cave. You know, King Nebuchadnezzar said, we'll try this again, boys. You didn't do it the first time. We're going to try this again. We're going to play the music again. The world will always give you another opportunity to compromise. But late at night, when the flames were at their highest, seven times hotter than they were at normal, because they would not gravel at the feet of falsehoods, they were thrown into the fiery furnace. And as discouraging as that sounds, the very next verse is so encouraging. And it says, there was another in the fire, one that looked like the Son of God. Church, no matter what is going on around us in the world today, you need to know who is with you. God is able. God will. But even if he doesn't, know who you are in Christ Jesus. Amen? Yeah. Amen. Know who you are in Christ Jesus. We know God is gracious and who is what God is. And we know who God helps. Can you believe that this morning? Let's give God praise.